Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, a major fast food chain is phasing out all food ingredients containing GMOs. We'll have highlights of Thursday's Mississippi Forestry Association Annual Awards Banquet. In Southern Gardening, deep fall favorites. Edges. When some plants are fading, Mahogany these plants excel. Hot and dry In the markets, Pond Bank catfish prices continue to climb higher as supplies continue to drop. While OA Cleveland believes both the high and the low in December cotton are in place. In the feature segment, Kent Winstead, the new Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Logger of the Year. Winstead's crew is known for keeping the work site clean, streams unpolluted, and safety. We water bar the roads, stabilize them, make sure we don't have any erosion. Uh, skid trails, we slash them. If it's on bad hills, we water bar them and then slash them. Uh, any stream crossing, we try to minimize crossings. Uh, this track, I'm not going to cross the stream zone at all. I'll come in from the other side to get the rest of it. everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. A major American fast food chain is now set to remove all bioengineered food ingredients from its menu. Leighton, last year many national restaurant chains announced that their pork suppliers had to begin phasing out the use of sow gestation crates. Well now one chain is extending that reasoning to food ingredients that contain GMOs. Chipotle Mexican Grill says it is phasing out its use of all food ingredients that contain GMOs. Chipotle's management said GMO-free ingredients will cost more, so it expects to raise its food prices by the middle of next year. Chipotle Mexican Grill has more than 1,500 locations in 45 states. It competes in the so-called fast casual segment of the restaurant business. The company claims to serve more than 750,000 customers per day. The move to GMO-free in food ingredients is in keeping with the company's moves in the past. In March, its menus began identifying foods that contain GMO ingredients. Chipotle says all of the meat that it serves is grown naturally and not in feedlots. Organic or sustainably grown food is also emphasized. During its recent annual meeting, the Mississippi Forestry Association presented its Outstanding Tree Farmer, Outstanding Logger, and Meritorious Service Awards. Patrice O'Brien became the first woman to receive the Outstanding Tree Farmer Award from MFA. O'Brien's Twin Oaks Farm in Yalabusha County was the subject of last week's feature story here on Farm Week and named the Outstanding Logger of the Year on October 17th at the MFA President's Banquet was Kent Winstead of Philadelphia. Winstead logging is the subject of this week's Farm Week feature, which you will see in a few minutes after the markets and receiving the MFA's Meritorious Service to Forestry Award for 2013 was Ruth Cook of Hattiesburg. Cook has served the Forestry Association as president and also has chaired the Mississippi Forestry Foundation. Well, as we end the uh, third week of October, let's check the Mississippi Weekly Crop Report from the Mississippi Ag Statistics Service in Jackson. This report reflects conditions as of last Sunday, October 20th. As we look at topsoil moisture in Mississippi, surplus 13% of the state, adequate 72%. In terms of Mississippi soybeans, 82% of the crop harvested as of the 20th, and that's on the five-year average for this state. So in terms of condition, 74% of the crop in good to excellent shape, so things looking very good there. Only 6% of the crop in poor to very poor condition. As we look at Mississippi cotton, 63% of the crop is harvested as of uh, October 20th, and that is ahead of the five-year average for this state. In terms of condition, uh, not too bad. Uh, excellent 23%, good 47%, fair 23%. As we look at Mississippi rice, uh, the harvest there is, for all practical purposes, ended 96% as of October 20th, probably through by this weekend. As we look at Mississippi peanuts, still running behind there, 39% of the crop harvested. 
Uh, the average for this state is 52%. In terms of condition, not quite as good as the other crops. Uh, excellent, 6%. Good, 50%. Fair, 44%. Mississippi sweet potatoes running on average for the harvest, 73% as of October 20th. In terms of condition, looking very good there. Excellent, 29%. Good, 59%. As we look at Mississippi wheat, 8% of the crop planted as of the 20th. The average for the state is 20%, and that's because we've had some dry weather in areas of the state, needed some rain to get the seeds up. 4% uh, of the crop has emerged. The average for the state is 11%. Well, do you think that when the summer ends, so does interest in the landscape? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, at Snitching Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us some of his favorite plants that will put on a show during the fall. With autumn fast approaching, it's the perfect time to enjoy some favorite plants putting on a beautiful show here at MSU's Truck Crops Branch Station in Crystal Springs. One of my absolute favorite fall plants that commands attention is pampas grass. This perennial grass with wiry serrated leaves is definitely not shy, with flower heads that can normally shoot 10 feet tall. But look at this dwarf selection called pumila, which only grows 6 feet tall. The flower heads are extremely dense and the stalks are held in tight groupings. This is an easy care plant that thrives in hot, full sun exposures like this landscape bed. Trends in plant foliage color tend to go in streaks and right now purple leafed plants are in. One of the best in recent years is Mahogany Splendor Hibiscus. This plant has dramatic purple burgundy leaves with coarse, deep serrated edges. Mahogany Splendor is perfect for our hot and dry Mississippi gardens. This plant is a vigorous grower and tolerates pruning well. In fact, this specimen has been cut back a couple of times this year. Another dramatic landscape plant is the large grass Penicetum vertigo. The coarse wide leaves of this grass are dark purple black. Reaching four feet tall or more, the upright growth of this grass creates a landscape presence. This plant requires little maintenance and should be planted in the full sun for best color. Vertigo should be considered an annual except on the coast where it may be perennial. So go ahead and try some of these easy to grow and beautiful plants in your landscape next year. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says the mahogany splendor hibiscus is said to be a perennial in zones 7 through 11. It can also be grown from seeds. In the feature segment today, Kent Winstead, he's the new Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Logger of the Year, as honored last week by the Mississippi Forestry Association. His motto, a tree today for a tree tomorrow. Time now for the markets with Layton and uh, the prices that catfish farmers receive continue to rise, you say. That's right, the monthly snapshot funded by the Catfish Institute is coming up. Also ahead in this segment this week, the big corn crop is good for the feeder cattle market. An 81 to 82 cent price floor may hold for D. Scotton, while soybeans face an inverted market as we head to the end of the month. Rising prices continue to be the main feature of catfish processing reports. The numbers you're about to see reflect activity in the United States during September. Last month, the average price paid to U.S. producers was $1.06 per pound. That is 26 cents per pound more than was paid in September 2012. Farm sales totaled over 29 million pounds round weight, an increase of 20% from one year ago. Processor sales were over 14 million pounds. That's an increase of 9% from September 2012. We shift from aquaculture to beef now in our market review. Extension Ag economists at Mississippi State are offering a positive outlook for the cattle sector at this point in the year. On Tuesday of this week, Extension Ag economist Brian Williams discussed the basis for this optimism. Well, Brian, we're rapidly approaching the end of October. Let's kind of review where we are with the fat cattle market and the feeder cattle markets. We are, and, and this is normally a time of year where the, the spring, spring born calves are flooding the market and, and typically it brings prices down at this point of the year, but it seems like this year we're not seeing that and the prices are holding steady. 
Is there really a reason why? How, what can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, well, I think there's there's a lot of things. Um, the market's got a real positive outlook with the numbers being down, and then when we look at at the corn crop, we're expecting a record corn crop, which is good news for the feeders. Uh, wheat uh, planting is going well. That's good news for our stockers. So just across the board, good news for the cattle industry. Well, I know box beef values kind of bounced a little bit higher on Monday uh, of this week. If that trend holds, what will that mean for the market? They did. They, they went up by uh, $2 on Monday. Um, I think what we're seeing is the, the beef demand is still strong despite these high prices. Uh, there's some concerns in the market right now that we may be hitting a ceiling in terms of the prices where consumers might be switching to cheaper alternatives like chicken, but for now we're, we're doing well. So that buyer support, that's still kind of a, an unanswered question. We need to go yeah. a little bit further along here maybe into November or so to really yeah. answer that. All right, um, we have had delay. The cattle on feed report from USDA is coming out, but will be a little bit delayed, I think, till October 31. Right. How has that impacted the, the livestock, particularly the cattle markets? Has it had any impact? Well, it has. It it's, hasn't been a huge impact, but I think it's really reduced the volatility in the markets because that information hasn't been flowing in, and so the traders are, are just dealing with the information they have. But now we're starting to see more information trickle in in the USDA's sending out up-to-date daily reports. So we are beginning to get that information back in and plugged yes. into the markets and uh, and also delayed but coming out will be a, a cold storage report. Right? Yeah, it'll be coming out on, on the 31st as well. From beef to dairy for our last trivia quiz of the month of October. Let's take a look at it now. How many gallons of ice cream were produced in the United States in the month of August? Here are your possible choices for an answer. Three and a half million gallons, six million gallons, 37 million gallons, or 72 million gallons. I'll tell you the answer at the end of this segment. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Late and Span reports a solid floor appears to be in the cotton market, while a new sawmill is opening in northeast Mississippi. In the feature segment today, the new Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Logger of the Year. A tree today for a tree tomorrow is his motto. At Mississippi State University, Extension is reaching beyond the college campus and impacting adult education. We're instructing agricultural professionals on the latest trends in research and technology, inspiring communities, empowering small businesses, and promoting the growth of healthy families where youth and adults can reach their fullest potential. The MSU Extension Service, sharing our vision for the future. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The Northwest Mississippi Forge Field Day will be next Friday, November 1st. It will take place at Gordon Farms on Curtis Road near Batesville. The hours are 9 a.m. to noon. Admission is free. Lowering costs is on the agenda. One way is to reduce supplemental hay needs by extending the grazing season. The Mississippi Forge and Grassland Conference is Friday, November 15th. It takes place at the Forest County Multipurpose Center located at the fairgrounds south of Hattiesburg. The hours are 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. Items on the agenda include turning annuals into premium beef. You'll also hear from Shari Swenson, this Mississippi cattlewoman, Manages, manages to have 300 days of grazing a year. She runs 70 head of cows on 125 acres. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We begin the row crop portion of the markets with Dr. O.A. Cleveland's latest outlook for cotton. Although some analysts warn that the December contract will dip to near 78 cents, Cleveland is still seeing solid support at the 81 to 82 cent price floor. The MSU professor emeritus also believes that both the high and the low in the DEES contract are in place and 
most probably, he says he thinks, for the March 2014 contract as well. Cleveland says the recent decision by the Chinese to open new import quotas is lending support to the fiber market. Well, trading in new crop soybeans is more challenging these days due to the current inverted market situation. Analyst Darren Newsom says that means the commercial side of the bean market still doesn't know where it's going to get the supply it needs to meet demand. You look at, again, at the inverted market, the, the Nov to Jan, Jan to March, March to May, May, July. And if you look at that Nov Jan, you say, okay, you got to sell into this. You got to unload everything and sell into this. But you got to take the whole thing into account. I mean, we're talking all the way out through the July contract after the South American crop will probably already be in. And if it's still inverted, what it's saying is there's still a great deal of concern over, over lack of supplies, lack of global supplies. So I think you feed the market a little bit at a time. You don't necessarily get into a hurry selling this thing. You set a target, you sell a few here, sell a few there. Keep doing it as the market wants to go higher. Keep feeding this inverted market. You want to hold some back because we have not completely dealt with the tight situation coming out of 12-13 and it doesn't look like it's going to improve that much at least through the first half of the 13-14 marketing year. Northeast Mississippi is getting a new sawmill. The Daily Journal reports American Land and Timber is expanding its operation located near Baldwin. This expansion includes not only a new sawmill, but the construction of a 20,000 square foot facility as well. The company produces lumber for export to overseas markets. They say this expansion will add 38 new jobs to the company payroll. Well, before our new feature story, let's check the trivia answer for this week. The correct choice is D, and that is a decrease of almost 5% from one year ago. The state's Outstanding Logger of the Year was announced on October 17th by the Mississippi Forestry Association. This year's winner is Kent Winstead Logging of Philadelphia. The Winstead operation embodies all of the attributes you would expect in a top flight wood harvesting crew. For this feature story, we cross the state line into the edge of Sumter County, Alabama, where Winstead Logging was beginning a new job in September. 83 is when I graduated high school, and I've, I've been out here every day since. To say that logging is in Kent Winstead's blood would be an understatement. In 1978, as a teenager, he was already working part-time in the woods. That's Kent on the left in this photograph. His father, Jeff Winstead, is in the center, and Kent's brother, Terry, is on the right. Kent's father learned the profession from his dad, Horace Winstead, seen in this photograph from 1951. Well, my grandfather logged, my great-grandfather logged some. He didn't log full-time, but he logged some. My dad helped both of them before he went in on his own. They logged with mules. Uh, I think my dad started out contract cutting. All he had was a chainsaw from my granddad. And, uh, they didn't have any, you know, they loaded, they, they skidded and loaded with mules. Uh, of course, they were, by the time I come along, they were done with that. This photograph from 1948 shows the mules on a Winstead logging site in Mississippi. The mules' names were Joe and Bailey. The boy standing closest to the log truck is Kent's uncle, Charles Winstead. The logs were going to Malpa Sawmill in Philadelphia. The man on the right in the photograph is Kent's great-grandfather, Hugh Winstead. The boy on the right is Kent's father, Jeff Winstead. Fast forward to 2013, 65 years later, and Jeff Winstead can still be found on a job site some days, helping out his son Kent whenever and however he's needed. He sold out to my brother-in-law and myself in 88, June of 88. We stayed together till October of 90. And, uh, been on my own ever since. Today, Kent Winstead Logging has two harvest crews, which usually operate together, and four company trucks. Altogether, there are 12 employees plus another six contract haulers. We're on a job that Kent began in September 2013 in the edge of Alabama, east of Porterville and Kemper County, Mississippi. I'm cutting for Warehouser Company, and Warehouser bought this track from the uh, University of South Alabama. Oh, it's 285 acre track. <clears throat> we got four patches on it that had never been thinned. I think they total about 70 acres of those four patches together. Oh, 
so it's a lot thicker on the ground. During the last two years, 70% of the company's work has been for Weyerhaeuser. Long before any of this equipment arrived to begin the clear cut, Kent Winstead was here using aerial photographs, maps, and footwork to develop a forest management plan for this job. Then, as he usually does, Kent brought out his motor grader the week before harvest work began. There were old roads here, but they were in pretty bad shape, so I, I got my dozer and motor grader over here a few days before the crew and uh, started working on them and get them shaped up, ditches opened up, ruts filled up, whatever, whatever has to be done. From the very beginning of each job, Kent's management plan always emphasizes the prevention of erosion, protecting water quality, and protecting soil quality on the site. We water bar the roads, stabilize them, make sure we don't have any erosion. Uh, skid trails, we slash them. If it's on bad hills, we water bar them and then slash them. Uh, any stream crossing, we try to minimize crossings. Uh, this track, I'm not going to cross the stream zone at all. I'll come in from the other side to get the rest of it. Landings are placed as far from any streamside management zone as possible. Soil quality is also protected by spreading slash on the entire track for natural fertilization. Soil compaction and rutting is minimized by the use of flotation tires on the equipment. These best management practices here and on every job by Winstead Logging emphasize Kent's definition of sustainable forestry and what it means to him. Managing the forest for today's needs and the needs of the future generations. Well, pretty much a tree today for a tree tomorrow. The first priority for Kent Winstead during all operations is the safety of his crew. The company has a business safety plan that outlines the best practices to be followed by all employees. For example, everyone on a job site, including this visiting reporter, is required to wear personal protective equipment. Also, each equipment operator and truck driver follows what's known as the all clear process when on the job. They look and make sure that anybody's on the ground, they know where they are, um, make sure they're out of the way. And then the last step of the process is to blow the horn before they, they start movement. There is also a policy about not walking within 10 feet of an operating piece of equipment, such as a feller buncher or skidder on the job site before anyone on the ground enters the so-called 10-foot circle around such pieces of equipment, the engine must be turned off by the operator. You know, before anybody can walk up, you have to kill the machine. Uh, outside that 10-foot circle, you, you have to lower all your implements to make sure they know, but, but just to make sure before you walk inside a 10-foot circle, you have to make sure they kill the engines. Around the knuckle boom loaders, the rule is no one is to be on the ground within two tree lengths of the operating machine. Each piece of equipment owned by Winstead Logging has a radio so that operators can communicate with each other at all times. Kent only has one crew member who is routinely on the ground on a job site. That is the trim man who goes around each departing load of wood to make sure there's nothing that will fall off on the highway. There are safety meetings each month in order for employees to receive alerts as well as reminders about best practices. The last lost time accident occurred in 2005 when a loader operator slipped off a trailer and sprained his ankle. The only other accident occurred in 1993. Winstead Logging's rolling stock includes two feller bunchers, each equipped with a saw head for clear cutting and thinning. There are two skidders, and there are two knuckle boom loaders, each with a delimmer. As a professional logger, Kent's harvesting policy is to utilize all merchantable wood products in order to minimize waste. This includes top wood. On this particular track, we're sorting at a 14-inch butt. Uh, the, the larger stuff goes to warehouse for the left at the saw log. Uh, go to a six inch top. Most of the stuff at a six inch top will get top wood out of it, double deck top wood. So we drop it in the slasher saw out of the D limmer and, uh, and cut top wood out of it and double deck it to Columbus for pulp wood. Uh, then anything too small for chipping saw, you, you got below 14 inches, anything that'll go to Millport for chipping saw down to a four inch top goes there and anything that's what little bits left below that goes to Columbus for fiber. With a strong emphasis on safety and dedication to the principles of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, Kent Winstead Logging is a model for others in the industry to follow. In his hometown of Philadelphia, Mississippi, people are not surprised at the recognition Kent is now receiving. Kent is a fourth, gen fourth generation logger and he's well respected and 
has a very good work ethic. And one thing that really stands apart is one of his mottos is if the job is worth doing, it's worth doing right the first time. And uh, that, that kind of says a lot about his quality of work and the person that he is. So we're very proud of him here in the Shelby County. Not only is Kent Winstead setting a good example for others in his industry, he is sending a good message for the logging community in Mississippi and other states. I'm Leighton Span reporting. And you can watch this feature story on Kent Winstead Logging again at the Farm Week website or on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel. And again, you can find us at farmweek.msucares.com. And again, uh, Kent Winstead, a fourth generation logger. Not that unusual to see a second or third generation, no. but fourth generation really sets them apart. And the motor grader on the site, the roads were really in excellent shape. And as a result, you get less mud tracked onto the highway and such as that. So uh, I think that's the first time we've seen one of those, but a good idea. I mean, it, it works. Yeah. When we got there, he was shaping the roads up. So We are at the end of Farm Week for this week on our next show. See what it takes to, to deliver certified on flavor catfish. And in the feature story next week, it is the slogan of Pride of the Pond of Tunica, Mississippi, certified on flavor. Everything this family does from the ponds to the processing plant is to ensure the most consistent, best tasting catfish. And in Southern Gardening, fall flowers. Fall doesn't mean having to do without landscape color. For the rest of the Farm crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.